Good morning. Uh, welcome at Bellevue. Uh, let me welcome you at the uh, start of the second season of Cava's Pepsin Coffee with Pepper. Uh, this morning, uh, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, another friend of mine next to Pepper, Zdenek Bakala. Uh, Pepper has been a mentor, friend, uh, and coach uh, to many of my peers. Uh, <coughs> the generation of mentorless, so to speak, after uh, the Velvet Revolution. And uh, I'm glad that uh, by interviewing and bringing here uh, global leaders to talk about the issue of leadership, we're getting a little bit of that orphancy, you know, back and uh, the advice of uh, uh, people who've been successful uh, through their wisdom, uh, patience, hard work uh, is being shared with us. Uh, Pepper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Honzo. Uh, and welcome. Welcome all to uh, the beginning of our, of our second season. It's, uh, it's a great joy to be here and to, to kick this off. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, our sponsor, who uh, has for 20 years been the leading asset management company in the Czech Republic, uh, the investment company of Ceska Sporjatelna and Martin Borda. Thank you very much. And let's acknowledge Jim. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, someone who is uh, on our coaching staff and the uh, director of business development for the Institute and uh, someone who I think is the human equivalent of perpetual motion, Kristen uh, Laranca Parpel. Kristen? And Final introduction uh, from the audience. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to someone who has been uh, an inspiration to me for, for many years. Uh, happens to be the mother of my personal coach uh, and the director of operations for us, my mother-in-law who came up from Cairo, Patricia McDonald. <laughs> All right, one more housekeeping thing. Beginning this month, uh, within the next seven days, uh, Prague Leadership Institute will launch a newsletter to, our, uh, to all of the people that are on our distribution list uh, around the world, in Asia, in North America, Europe, uh, and Central and Eastern Europe. And what we're going to do is this. We have been trying to figure out different ways that we could add to the intellectual capital uh, and the discussion about leadership here, but on a global basis. And so what I've asked uh, our faculty to do is each month contribute, two faculty members will contribute uh, a short thought piece <coughs> on leadership. And to kick off uh, our newsletter, Didoste Skalova from uh, Ogilvy PR, Managing Director of Ogilvy PR, will contribute a column on her thoughts about five points about common sense leadership. And with her will be Doug Broadman, the CEO of Pilsinski Prozroy, who will talk about his favorite topic and one of mine, everything communicates. So please, uh, let's acknowledge uh, their contribution. All right, let's get down to my guest this morning. Uh, the more I know about Zdenek Bakala, the harder it gets to describe him. Uh, I guess you could say it all began when, when he hid his life savings in a sandwich and uh, left Czechoslovakia for the United States. And I think it's fair to say today that if he tried to put all of his money in a sandwich, he'd need a little bigger sandwich uh, to carry across the border with him. But you know him as one of the most successful uh, investors uh, in Europe uh, and a principal in a, in a very successful private equity firm. But you're going to have to think of him in a different context uh, now as time goes on. And we're going to talk about that new context 
and the reinvention of Zdeněk Bakala, but things like uh, gentleman goat farmer, uh, a beer entrepreneur, a cycling team owner, these are now things that we must think about when we talk about uh, one of the favorite sons of this country. And so with that, I would like to welcome our guest and get things underway. Zdeněk, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, have a seat. And I want to thank you for coming out to join us, even fighting a cold as you are. So I, I apologize, first of all, for the cold. It might be a little bit difficult for me, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get over it. Well, anyway, welcome. And uh, as, as you and I have discussed, I, I would like to cover a number of things uh, this morning that deal with uh, with your life transition and, and get your thoughts on a number of things from Czech politics to philanthropy uh, to what I know you feel is one of the biggest mistakes that investors make today and one of the things that separates you from what we would consider an ordinary investor. But what I want to do first is get uh, some perspective on your life through your eyes. Uh, tell me, Zdenia, how would you describe uh, your life's journey and your experience in the context of past, present, and future? This, as you know, uh, by the way, thank you for having me this morning in this highly illustrious place and, uh, and a highly illustrious group of people. Um, that's one of Pepper's typical questions <laughs> that would take a book to respond to. Um, so uh, I will make it shorter and maybe give you over time an opportunity to ask questions that are more specific and, uh, and more to a single point. But um, um, I think that uh, uh, if my life has been re relatively ordinary in a certain sense, and the sense is that I early on was able to um, uh, determine what it is I want to do, how I want to go about it, and uh, I have uh, uh, throughout my life essentially followed a formula that I have uh, that I have learned that uh, that I have decided would be the best for my my life and my career. What is that formula? It's. Uh, uh, pertains specifically to my working life, but uh, way back in business school, many, many years ago, uh, I remember learning that uh, uh, an individual who enters the investment banking profession, which uh, I was about to do at the time, should have really, uh, in his mind, a relatively natural progression of his career in terms of first uh, becoming a, uh, an employee at an investment, investment banking operation, uh, acting as an agent for, for clients. Over time, one uh, would have a, a, typically would have a desire to set up his own business so that he stops being an employee, but he still continues acting as an agent for principles in transaction, the transactions. And uh, uh, naturally, and to every investment banker and business school student, the last progression is uh, to um, uh, become, to have earned enough capital throughout the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, uh, career to be able to liberate oneself from having to be an agent for others and can become principals in transactions. But if we go back, if we go back to, uh, and, and I wasn't joking in the beginning, I mean, I've read that uh, what you did was you hid a $50 bill in a sandwich, which at that time was your life savings and you set out for America. And you told me once uh, about the role that your parents played in that, that they uh, gave you some advice. Tell us about that, Zdenia. Well, it's, uh, I grew up in a family that, uh, that uh, uh, stayed, uh, uh, kind of insulated itself from the communist reality. Uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and uh, and I was always brought up to um, with the belief that uh, once education is uh, the 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 first condition that has to be satisfied in order for one to have a to have a happy life, 
and uh, when it became clear that it was difficult or next to impossible for me to uh, go and study at a good gymnasium in, in Brno, where I was growing up at the time, uh, I decided it was time to leave the country and uh, my parents, uh, because they held the same belief that uh, they taught me earlier on, uh, very much supported me and understood that it's better for me to leave the country than to stay. Did you leave with a dream? I mean, <clears throat> other than... Of course. <laughs> what was that? What was the dream that you left uh, with in your mind? Oh, it's, it's, prob it's difficult to... It's a long time ago, first of all, a very long time ago. Um, I really can't tell you many of the details of it, but, uh, but the, the truly the, the only, the overriding reason uh, I had for leaving the country is to be able to go to a, a high quality school and study. And, it, and naturally the, the dream at that time, uh, which turned out to uh, have worked out later on, uh, the dream at the time must have been to uh, be able to get a decent, uh, university degree in, in, in the States. But it wasn't, to, to it, study. it certainly wasn't easy for you because when you, you, you came to America, you had a friend living in uh, Lake Tahoe, yes. didn't you? Yes. Uh, from, the, uh, from Czechoslovakia. Uh, and you went to stay with, uh, with him and his family initially, is yes. that correct? Yes. And uh, you got a job as a, uh, as a dishwasher in a casino in, in Lake Tahoe, right? Uh, and you and I've talked about, you know, Berkeley was not uh, uh, an easy school to get into. Uh, it is one of the, uh, the best institutions uh, in the United States. But why did you pick Berkeley? Why not uh, another school? In California, as you know, uh, you have a choice of two top schools unless you unless you uh, count U UCLA in the top, in the top group. But um, anyway, you know, the, 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 the two pinnacles of education in California is Stanford and UC Berkeley. Uh, it, the, the, the reason is very simple. Uh, UC Berkeley at the time had um, uh, a, a very attractive uh, tuition for in-state students, which I was as resident of the state of California, and uh, therefore it was a no-brainer for me to, to uh, apply to Berkeley, which at the time was $1,600 a school year. And that is the greatest bargain in the history of education, as far as I can uh, tell. Significant difference than the tuition to Stanford <laughs> uh, at that time. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, you and I were, were having lunch, and I asked you how you felt your success and your wealth had changed you. And I was struck by your answer because you said, it hasn't changed me at all. And I, I said, why? <laughs> and, and you looked at me and said, because I understand money. Put that in context for us. I would venture to say that I know everything about money there is to be, to be uh, learned or known about it. There were times I couldn't afford to take the bus so I had to walk and, uh, and uh, therefore I understand the value of money as means of, of surviving. Uh, I have studied all my life and worked in finance. Uh, I've studied economics and finance and worked in fi finance all, all my life. So I would venture to say that uh, uh, I'm quite uh, uh, good at understanding how money is being used in a modern eco economy, but also what's, what the substance of it is and where it comes from. And, um, uh, and because I have had the privilege of uh, being able to live my life with considerable amounts of money at my disposal, but also many years with uh, essentially no money at all, I have learned and added that, when you add that to my experience in finance and, and uh, in banking, I would venture to say that I understand not only the, the positive benefits that money can bring to you, but uh, maybe more than many others, the insidious, the risk of, of, of money as, uh, acting very insidiously to change people's lives, which happens around us every single day. How, how did you learn and I, that? And I know I, I, I understand that, and I know how to defend myself against it. How did you learn that? 
uh, experience, experience and uh, uh, the ability to, you know, live all kinds of situations uh, uh, with or without money or about money, as uh, because my profession was mostly about money. But you know, one of the things that uh, over the last few years that uh, has interested me about uh, your your path and and I would say your your attitude about it is, I, I get the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean I get the impression that money is not what drove you. I mean, people think of an investment banker as the Gordon Gecko of Wall Street, you know, the guy who's just out to get the buck. But I, I just have this feeling that uh, there was something more in it for you. Um, as an anecdote, one of the uh, uh, graduation speakers at UC Berkeley in the 80s, and I would guess it was 1985, was uh, um, 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 a gentleman whose name is Boski. What was his first name? Ivan. I, yes, Ivan Boski. And uh, he made the Greed is Good speech at UC Berkeley as graduation speech, and yes. the movie just uh, you know took it over from there. Um, no, I think that uh, success uh, is what drives people, and money simply happens to be the the uh, measurement, the, the unit we use to measure success. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you're taking a more passive role in investing today, but I would like to get your views on <coughs> just the general uh, topic of, of business uh, in, in the Czech Republic. And in general, you know, what, what you feel are the underdeveloped opportunities here with regard to our capabilities, first of all? As an investor, I can go through all the sectors and tell you what I think. I think in, in many, in, maybe one step back, our and BXR's investment philosophy is, um, uh, has evolved in the following manner. We originally uh, had an investment thesis to look for uh, old economy assets in Central and Eastern Europe. E Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, industrial uh, assets, tangible assets that we could then apply our, what we think is our skill at uh, restructuring and, uh, and turning into viable, viable businesses. Uh, we have pursued that strategy for a number of years and uh, we have become, in a way, too large for the market that we have selected for ourselves initially, and we have had to diversify uh, away from Central and Eastern Europe um, in order to just get some proper uh, level of diversification into our portfolio. Um, so we today spend more time on uh, understanding a healthcare investment opportunity in Singapore than uh, a, uh, um, you know, a, a manufacturing plant in the Czech Republic. Uh, when it comes to, this, to Central Europe, our focus clearly today is Poland. Poland has the, the, is the, the most promising uh, country today in, in Central Europe. It has still uh, opportunities, even privatization opportunities, because they went about their privatization in, in a much more measured manner than, uh, than Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic uh, did. So uh, as, a, as an investor to the and and uh, the Czech Republic has the, the best opportunities uh, happen to uh, surface during times of transformation, deregulation, mm -hmm. privatization. That time in the Czech Republic has, is over. Uh, the Czech Republic, uh, and maybe we'll get into that, should focus on, on uh, other things that are then arguing about the 90s and who did what. And uh, uh, I view Poland as, as the single most attractive uh, uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, natural resources in Poland, Poland be it uh, coal, uh, shale gas, or or uh, uh, any other commodity, there are a number of mining companies in Poland, are very extremely attra attractive because they serve 
a landlocked market which is largely inaccessible to the to the uh, seaborne commodities that uh, are exported but elsewhere. From an in investment criteria uh, standpoint, what is it that you are looking for in the future? Because I know you, I mean, you're, you're like a, a mini Emerson Corporation. I mean, they have a ladder company, they have a fan company, they have, I mean, I know you have a, you have a <laughs> mattress business, you have a, you know, a number of things. What are you looking for? as you look around? Today, I truly and genuinely look for, uh, to, to become involved personally, look for a level of fun and enjoyment in, in the work. Uh, for example, I work uh, very closely with the cycling team that, uh, that uh, we have bought, or the winery that we uh, recently acquired in South Africa. And uh, I leave the, the, the big, boring, uh, uh, but profitable uh, stuff to the uh, large organization of uh, of uh, professionals and offices we have created over the all over the year in the last. If few that years. were a luxury, <laughs> one of the luxuries you afford yourself, that's probably it. Being able now to do the things that that you think are are fun, and we, I want to get into that in a moment. But before we leave the the realm of of business, um, what? Where do you see the Czech Republic in the context of, of the global economy? I mean, what's your view of, of that? I'm almost a federalist when it comes to the European Union. Really? You know, so I, I can easily imagine a world without the Czech Republic, with, uh, uh, which, uh, which I'm sure to many of you will be uh, uh, treasonous well what do you uh, mean by that opinion well, well, let me first All right. get to your question uh, today frankly speaking you know we, we are and um, um, uh, you can you can open any of mr. Machacek's uh, analysis and everybody's spending so much time including mr. Machacek spinning wheels about what exactly is is happening to us today and where the Czech Republic's role uh, is, I think it's relatively simple. Economically speaking, the Czech Republic is a small country on the German border, which determines pre pretty much everything uh, that we need to know about it. Uh, uh, the, in terms of, uh, of uh, economics, investment, and uh, uh, industrial cycles. Um, as I said, I, I'm a great supporter of the European Union, and I would I do not mind seeing erosion of uh, of uh, 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 national authority under the European Union, and therefore over time, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, when it's appropriate and insti the institutions have been built up to to be able to support that, I would not at all mind uh, seeing Czech Republic become a, a handing over its sovereignty to a larger European entity to a much fuller extent than today. 